Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm the moderator of this session, the keynote session. I'm Dilara. And uh, in this session, uh, our first present keynote speaker is uh, Professor Robert J. Connors from Purdue University. Uh, Professor, are you ready to present your presentation? I believe so. So. Would you like me to go ahead and uh, share the screen now? Yes, yes, please, thank you. All right. And I hope you are seeing my first slide. Yes, great, we see, thank you. Would you like me to begin? Uh, if you're able to, yes. Okay, yes. well, thank you everyone. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, coming to you from uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, the home of Purdue University. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I really wish uh, we could have uh, been with you all in person, but of course we have to deal with this virus right now, but hopefully in the future we'll get to make a trip. My wife and I were very much looking forward to visiting with everyone. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about um, uh, Dr. Corkmus, Jim Corkmus, who works with me here at Purdue, kind of had a nice presentation earlier today uh, about a topic that we've been working on for about 10 years here at Purdue, along the concept of what we call here in the U.S. Uh, fracture critical uh, bridges. And so I do have to acknowledge a lot of other people who've been involved with this research over this uh, period of time. Uh, several were students of mine uh, who've now moved on to uh, faculty positions and different roles in consulting. Uh, but uh, I get to take all the credit today uh, but I really owe a lot to these individuals who've worked hard on this research over the years. So I kind of, I want to set the stage a little bit about how we handle things in the United States in terms of uh, a certain classification of structures uh, that really in Europe isn't, isn't really viewed the same way. Um, really, the U.S. is probably the only place that does it this way. Uh, and these are referred to as fracture critical members. Uh, we often call them fracture critical bridges. Um, but I noticed, uh, you know, I underline that word believed uh, because part of this is uh, often based on not so much uh, qualitative or quantitative engineering, but rather qualitative. We don't make any calculations to demonstrate uh, that these members are fracture critical. So what does that mean? Well, the definition that we have in our uh, bridge specifications, um, first of all, the member has to be made out of steel. It has to be subjected to tension. And then there's the part that is the redundancy or perceived redundancy portion associated with the member. And so a definition that has the words like probably <laughs> uh, in it are very difficult, right? Because well, what I think might happen versus what you think may happen can be two completely different things. Um, but because of this, it, it's really changed how we do things in the United States for well over 40 years now. The impact of designating something a fracture critical member, as Jem had mentioned earlier, was that the, the member itself is fabricated different, and that's not a huge cost uh, in terms of the steel fabrication. It ranges between 10 and 15 percent increase in cost, but it's the life cycle cost associated with what we call arm's length inspection, that the inspector has to be up close to the component. And the objective is to look for damage that could be small fatigue cracks, uh, things like that, that could lead to sudden brittle fracture. And that's very costly over the life of the structure. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the term came about after really maybe two major failures in the U.S. But what's interesting is we'll see those two failures uh, don't necessarily have anything or wouldn't have been prevented necessarily by this. At least one of them wouldn't. So that's kind of the background to where we are in the U.S. Um, the problem is, although we have this very strong reaction to these kinds of bridges, um, their performance has been excellent. Uh, we, we shy away from using uh, these types of structural configurations, and in particular, say, long span tied arches or trusses or two girder type configurations. In the United States, owners generally don't want to make these types of structures. One reason is because it's perceived to be non-redundant and because it's non-redundant, there is a perception that it will fail, right? Now we all know that the girder 
doesn't know there's only one other girder, right? So the likelihood of the event isn't influenced by the number of girders that are there. But the other big reason is the inspection cost, the up close hands-on inspection, or if it's a box girder like on the left there, they have to get inside and so forth. So that's very costly. What's interesting, you know, most other industries have figured out how to deal with this idea, right? We don't have 10 wing aircraft. Uh, we have two wing aircraft and travel across the Atlantic is perfectly safe, right? Because they've kind of worked through this issue of redundancy and kind of view it from a risk point of view. Now in the US, how we try to control fracture uh, has grown out of responses to problems. And, and often when that happens, we get fragmented um, approaches. In other words, the material we select, uh, we use Sharpie impacts to kind of screen out material, Sharpie impact data, uh, or what we do in design, that's independent of the practices that are in the shop or our field inspection requirements. This arm's length inspection that has to happen every 24 months uh, isn't tied to crack tolerance necessarily or any performance of the structure. In, in a true fracture control plan, right, you would, you would integrate all these things, that if you have a weakness in one area, maybe my inspection um, isn't so reliable, well, I would do something in design or fabrication or during the life of the structure to compensate for that. And so illustratively, if we inspect every 24 months with an arm's length inspection, if, if something happens you know, the day after you perform the inspection, maybe a crack becomes detectable. Um, there is no guarantee that that crack will remain stable until the next inspection, right? So nothing is linked or tied together. Um, the crack size that an inspector can reliably find isn't linked to the tolerance of the structure, right? So it's, it's good, they're good practices, but, but they're not linked, right? And so that kind of leads to inefficiencies or, or lack of reliability. The other thing that's interesting in, in the US is that if you meet the fracture control plan, which is primarily in material selection and fabrication uh, requirements, uh, if you meet that, you get no relief. In other words, a bridge that was designed and built in the 1950s in the United States that has no necessary, like we didn't have uh, toughness requirements, there was no fatigue design. So a bridge with poor fatigue details, lots of truck traffic, that's treated the same as a bridge that may be opened today, <laughs> made with modern uh, materials, high toughness steels, infinite fatigue life, all the good things. We all know that those two structures clearly aren't equal. Yet from an inspection point of view, uh, as controlled by the federal regulations here, they are treated the same. That's like saying those two locomotives are the same, right? You know, an early steam engine has different operational characteristics, maintenance requirements, and so forth, and capabilities, as opposed to a modern diesel electric locomotive. They're clearly not the same. And so because of that, it would seem that maybe we could treat this a little more rationally. Now, I said the, the fracture control plan in the United States has been somewhat reactionary. Uh, and when we saw a problem, we corrected it and moved forward. But, but that's reactionary, right? And so after a series of events, sometimes, uh, the reactions begin to take different paths. So, so let's look at just a couple of bridges um, that maybe changed how we do some things in the United States. For example, the classic failure in the United States that's often cited as a bridge referred to as the Silver Bridge or the Point Pleasant Bridge. It was a bridge built from high strength steel. It was built in the very early 1900s, circa 1920. And it was an I-bar suspension bridge over the Ohio River. Now, the bridge was supposed to be a cable suspension bridge, but the contractor elected to use I-bars uh, as, a, you know, as a substitution, it was approved, um, and the bridge was in service. However, in 1967, the bridge collapsed, very famous failure. Um, the problem is, is the failure was, as a, was due to the very, very high strength steel, over 100 uh, KSI steel or 690 MPA steel, um, and down where the pin, and I-bar uh, were you know, in contact with each other, there was some stress corrosion cracking and the defect that led to the fracture was about the size of your pinky nail down in the I-bars. It was non-detectable. Um, and so this bridge led to some of the inspection programs we have in the US, but realistically a bridge inspector could have been sitting at every pin joint 24 hours a day 
and they would have rode the bridge down into the Ohio River. So the inspection wouldn't have made a difference here. But this bridge is still cited as, as, a, as a reason we need to do what we do for inspection, yet inspection wouldn't matter. Now the question is, do we do this anymore? Do we make I-bar bridges? Well, no, we don't. Do we use steel that is extremely brittle? We don't. Um, as an example, if you read the old reports, <clears throat> the steel, if you boiled it, put it in boiling water, it still had what we call single digit foot pounds in terms of toughness. So it was effectively like glass, we, we don't do that. And again, the inspection wouldn't have made any difference here, but we still cite this bridge. Now, another bridge, uh, some of the issues we've had is with welding. And a good example of a problem with a welded bridge is a, referred to the Neville Island Bridge, also over the Ohio River uh, near the Pittsburgh area. And it, it used a, a welding process in very large flanges, um, referred to as the electroslag process. And it was a wire feed welding process. And when the wire spool ran out, they had to change the spool, continue the welding and, and went along. And, and there was a, a defect introduced. So they repaired the weld. That repair uh, was not subjected to the same level of inspection as the initial welding. This is a photo of the girder, it's completely fractured. There were two primary girders that carried six lanes of interstate traffic. Now you'll notice the bridge didn't collapse. All right, that's a gentleman taking a photo of it up in the air. So do we allow this today? Well, we don't allow even that kind of weld process anymore. The bridge was fabricated in the early 1960s, late, or very, very early 1970s, um, rather. Do we allow that? No, we have very stringent weld repair process, inspection requirements, procedures, the weld, that welding process isn't even permitted anymore. Would field inspection have made a difference? Well, no, this is a sudden pop in brittle fracture. In fact, a, a riverboat person is who saw it, someone running a tugboat uh, or a container ship type uh, boat on the Ohio River. Another bridge that had a certain type of detail was just a poor quality gusset plate, we refer to it, or shelf plate connection. Uh, in this case, this is where we have uh, an attachment on the uh, components um, right down in here. So here is the web of the girder and the flange and very poor quality welding used to attach this together. Uh, a small fatigue crack did initiate, that crack became unstable and the girder fractured. Again, two girder bridge. This photo was with the bridge still in service. It was still carrying traffic as was the previous Neville Island Bridge. So do we allow this today? No, we do not. Uh, we have guidance on how to make those kinds of details. And remember the bridge was never even designed for fatigue. Would field inspection help? Maybe. There is some evidence that there was some fatigue cracking. So if you happen to uh, be able to detect this crack uh, and you were there at the right time, maybe you could have detected it before the girder failed. Another form of failure we have had is related to what we call constraint-induced fracture. And the classic example is a bridge called the Hone Bridge in the Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. Uh, there are two bridges here, actually. There is a three-girder unit and another three-girder unit. They're twins. Um, the interior girder failed first, leading to failure of the exterior girder. And the, can't quite see it here, but there's big fractures in the uh, inner girder. Um, the bridge sagged about four feet after it failed. Uh, there are three girders. The only real load carrying member for flexure was the flange in this case. And this is an end span. So there's no continuity off in this direction. Uh, the bridge stayed up, traffic continued on the bridge. Um, it was shut down within a matter of, uh, you know, probably 30 or 40 minutes. So it didn't carry a lot of traffic. But do we allow this today? No, in our AASHTO specifications, we have specific guidance that uh, we worked on developing of how to make those kinds of welded details so these kinds of failures don't occur. And once again, would inspection help? Well, no, it's a sudden in, pop in fracture, right? So, so the program that is intended to prevent these things wouldn't have prevented the fractures we've seen. And then finally, the most recent is a, is a fracture in a large truss bridge over the Delaware River uh, on the eastern side of Pennsylvania, between Pennsylvania and New Jersey, it carries about six or eight lanes of traffic. This is in the negative moment region uh, on the bridge. So this is a, a continuous span truss uh, right near the pier. Um, and this tension cord here, very large rolled shape, the bridge was built in the 1950s. And if you look close, you'll see two little darker spots here. That's from misdrilled holes. In fact, you see they line up with these rivets. And what happened was they misdrilled some holes and in the 1950s, rather than leave the hole, they just filled it, sort of, 
with some weld metal. And if you then fast forward to the year it fractured just a few years ago, uh, it was fine until the day it fractured. In fact, if you notice, the paint is beautiful, right? Uh, this was found during the painting inspection. The fracture occurred after they had painted the girder. So again, do we allow this? No, we do not allow misdrilled holes. Um, back then, it, it didn't really phase anybody to do that. Uh, fabricators would not do that today. And the steel was actually non-weldable. It was a, a grade of steel that was non-weldable because it was intended to be riveted. And again, would field inspection help? Well, no, it's a sudden pop-in fracture. In fact, if you look historically through the failures that have occurred that are more noteworthy in the United States, none of the bridges collapsed. Really, only the silver bridge is the one that collapsed. That was purely a fracture issue. So the bridges where no one thought about redundancy, in other words, primary member failure and the consequence of that, all continued to carry live load. The last one I showed, the Delaware River Bridge carried, like I said, six lanes of interstate traffic for a period of about six weeks, we estimate. Um, bridge didn't sag, didn't uh, really respond poorly at all. So the bridge has redundancy, even though we kind of in our minds think it doesn't. Now there's other things to keep in mind. Um, as I mentioned, the real cost associated with these uh, types of structures is the long-term in-service inspection. Now we perform that, or so we think, for safety. But the question we have to ask ourselves is when we're doing inspection, whose safety are we concerned about? Now generally we would say the public. But remember, when we close lanes, certainly in the United States, and I'm sure across Europe and across the world, traffic gets backed up. And we've had issues here just in the state of Indiana where when traffic is backed up, trucks can't stop, they are not paying attention, uh, and we have serious accidents. We have had a bridge closed here near the Lafayette area, Lafayette area a few years ago. And certain, I think three or four people lost their lives in two different accidents because of truck accidents associated with the lane closures. One of my colleagues in the transportation area studied this and found that you're 24 times more likely to have a serious traffic accident just after a few minutes of a traffic backup. So we have to think about public safety from that point of view, as well as highway worker safety when we close lanes. If we're closing a lane for safety to do the inspection, we need to be confident that it's justified and that we can find the damage that we're concerned about. So one of the things we did at Purdue with this idea of probability of detection, in the United States, we perform visual inspection. Uh, and for these fracture critical bridges, we perform arm's length up close inspection every 24 months. But we have no data or had no data until we did this study to look at the probability of detection. In other words, what's the likelihood of finding a crack, surface breaking crack of a certain size? So we statistically set up a uh, a significant number of specimens. We brought in about 30 plus uh, bridge inspectors, real bridge inspectors, not graduate students, put specimens in the air where we introduced fatigue cracks. We knew where they were, we knew their sizes. Unfortunately, the data aren't very encouraging. In fact, if I plot all the data uh, of the different inspectors on the POD curve, and you may be familiar with these where the vertical axis is probability of a hit, in other words, finding a crack, and then this is crack length on the horizontal axis, you'll see some interesting trends. In other words, you would expect, as most of the data show, that individual inspectors, the likelihood of finding the crack increases with crack size. Except for these three. For these three individuals, the larger the crack, the less likely they were to find it. Now that's probably counterintuitive. Uh, but what we found is if we look at the, what we call under data, like years of experience, very often we say, well, I'll go get this inspector because they're very experienced. That's not a guarantee of likelihood of finding something because sometimes we get set in our ways. In other words, I've inspected bridges for 30 years. That's not a crack. I've seen that a hundred times. In this case, they were cracked. So, so previous experience doesn't necessarily help us uh, with our capability. Now, the other thing that we'll see here is people will say, well, that applies to this group of inspectors. And, and that's true, but this group of inspectors was from several states um, and different individuals. And, and the argument often is, well, our inspectors find small cracks. So did this group, right? Just not reliably. Some were pretty good, some not so good. And so finding something doesn't mean you found everything. 
And so when we look at the data, the 50-50 crack, 50% 50 probability would find or miss is about an inch. And 90% uh, probability is about five and a half inches long. So, you know, 25 millimeters, that's a pretty good size crack. Now, remember I said there's no guarantee that the structure can tolerate that crack. That's just where we are in terms of detection. Now, we're gonna come back to these numbers in a little bit. So if we look at the various detection rates, like I said, they're not very encouraging. It would be nice if the structure could tolerate those kinds of cracks. So if we start to look at it differently from a risk point of view, uh, we have our standard you know, likelihood and consequence kind of risk approach here. So in the US, what we basically say is on the likelihood side, I can control certain things, toughness, detailing, fatigue stress ranges, right? Things I can control that'll influence the likelihood. And then on the consequence side, well, is it collapse? Is it out of service? Is it loss of life? There's different things I can say are consequence, but I can kind of try to uh, control those. But what we say today is that if I have just say a two girder steel bridge, that it is always high consequence all the time. So the consequence I would put here. But let's say we look at the experience where two girder bridges actually have not collapsed and have carried traffic with no one thinking about it. What if today I did some analysis using the tools that are readily available and I could say that under some agreed upon load combination, the bridge will stay up. There's not gonna be any issue with the structure. Well, now I would be low risk in terms of consequence, or I'd be, be low consequence. And of course, if I could design a new bridge with infinite fatigue life, high toughness material, oh, and I also have very low consequence, then it's a very reliable system. And that's kind of where the approaches are taking us. And so really our overall goal has been to try to look at fracture limit state more rationally because then the term goes away, right? It's just, it's a tension member and we treat it like any other member. And I think illustratively, the best way to think of it is in the US, say in a truss, we don't have buckling critical members and to lose a compression member is probably worse than a tension member. Um, and we do that because we believe calculations for compression. In this country, we kind of shy away from anything having to do with fracture. We kind of get scared of it for some reason. So maybe there's a way to address that. And we believe just using state of the practice approaches, we can treat this limit state a little more rationally and have a highly reliable structure. And so there's other ways that we found that we can do this to address this fracture critical member concern without simply adding more steel and decreasing the economy or competitiveness of steel bridges. And so I'll, I'll talk about two types of projects that we had, one on internal redundancy, and then one on system analysis very briefly. And then look at how this is being implemented in terms of an integrated fracture control plan. <clears throat> so that'll be kind of what we'll focus on. So there are two brand new guide specifications as of the year 2018 in the United States that we at Purdue uh, had the privilege of working on and basically wrote these for AASHTO. The first one is looking at what we call internal redundancy. And then the second one is kind of related to what Dr. Korkmas talked about earlier, system analysis or system redundancy. IRMs is now the new definition of the member and then system redundant members. So internally redundant members and system redundant members. So we're trying to get away from that fracture critical member designation. So for internal redundancy, we have our classic big, you know, riveted built up member, but in the United States, we actually bolt some members together to gain redundancy, but we, we get no benefit for doing that at least today. And so in the research, you know, these are those members that are made of multiple components, whether they're riveted or bolted, uh, a strategy that other industries routinely use. Um, we know it exists. We know that members have internal redundancy if one component fails. Uh, we just had a bridge over the Ohio a few days ago that there was a fire and one of the plates cracked and there wasn't a concern because we can use these tools now, but we didn't have those tools just a few years ago. And that's what these specifications are allowing us to do is have a codified method to address redundancy of the component. And so basically we would look at the member itself. And then if one of the components say that bottom flange were to fail, suddenly completely fail, uh, what would happen? Does it have the capability to carry uh, some level of live load we think is appropriate statistically? And then when it comes to the inspection interval, you know, if the plate breaks right after I leave, well, how long would it last in service? And so all specimens then were subjected to fatigue testing 
to try to evaluate the fatigue life under service loads in the faulted condition. And by faulted, I mean one of the components is broken. And you know, using that information, then we can set inspection intervals based on rational calculations. So the experimental testing program was a lot of fun because we needed to test large scale, really full scale components. And so we weren't concerned about initial fatigue life, that's well documented. Uh, so we would notch a component, sharpen fatigue cracks uh, in the specimens. We would then cool them and we would get them very cold. And the reason is we wanted the specimens to be on the lower shelf toughness because we didn't wanna have anyone say, well, you know, your, your uh, experimental data are because you had very tough steel. So all of our steel was brittle, single digit lower shelf foot pounds or even joules, um, down to minus 120 Fahrenheit at times. So very, very cold. So we would pre-crack the steel, calculate a critical crack size, load the girder. And unfortunately, in every case but one, nothing happened. The cracks didn't jump. And that has to do with the compliance of the girder. So what we had to do is actually drive wedges into the crack. So under full load with wedges driven hydraulically, we would drive the crack. And that's because we want to get the big bang, if you will. We want the big energy release to show or to find out if the fracture would have enough energy release to propagate through the other components. Just show you real quick, uh, like in terms of the specimens, we looked at bolted and riveted. We, we did our own hot riveting here at Purdue. Um, the girders were very large scale, some single and double cover plates. The deepest were about 1.2 meters deep. Uh, so these were very large girders. So we'll show a video here. If it comes through. Uh, that's uh, one of the types of tests. The, the bottom cover plate here is about 40 millimeters thick and the um, cover plates here, maybe about 20, or I'm sorry, the angles are about 20 millimeters thick. The point is, this is a poorly proportioned girder, a tremendous amount of energy stored in that cover plate. But as you noticed, uh, when the fracture occurred, the bang occurred, the girder didn't break in half. A whole series of tests were done in flexural members. We've never had one fracture. We then switched to axial members, large uh, tensile members, uh, large tensile members on the strong floor of the lab. We could look at bending and all the secondary effects. And again, here's a series of videos. These were at about a million pounds. Or so. You'll notice none of these fail. All poorly proportioned. Tremendous load inside the uh, girder in the main number. and the steam coming off because they're cold. <laughs> so that allowed us then to move into uh, our uh, full finite element analysis. We could take all that data, calibrate models, look at things that uh, we couldn't look at experimentally and move forward. The results, well, we can have parameters that uh, will give us confidence that fractures don't jump. Basically set criteria to ensure internal redundancy in a faulted condition. We refer to that as cross boundary fracture resistance. The fatigue tests also showed that we can use existing approaches with some slight modifications to uh, accurately and reliably characterize the fatigue life in the faulted state to set an inspection interval. That then has been turned into specification language by our team uh, and was approved by AASHTO in 2018. This is a major change for us because of the inspection implications. Because now for the first time ever in the US, we have a specification that sets the inspection interval, right? It's beginning to be in integrated, as you can see. The current 24 month interval was just based on opinion. There was no reason it wasn't 16 months or 24 months versus 32 months. But now we can set it based on calculation with appropriate levels of conservatism in the calculations as well. Now we have a rational approach. But the inspection itself is different because see, we've shown that it can carry load and we showed a complete component can break. That means the objective is different. See, now we're not looking for little cracks at every rivet hole where there could be 100,000 rivets on a bridge. We don't care about that. And by the way, the cracks are under the rivet head until you can see them. We're not looking for small cracks like this. We're looking for large cracks. So if I go back to the probability of detection data, we can see that 
we have a reliable crack size we can find. Incidentally, this is one of our specimens from our POD test. Inspectors missed that crack. Some inspectors missed that crack. And so we've started to integrate things. The advantage is it's all connected, right? The interval of inspection is linked with the tolerance of the member as well as the capability of the inspector. Now, not every member is internally redundant, right? We have these kinds of members, maybe they're welded or uh, members that could fracture completely. And so that was the other concern. And so what do we do in those cases? Well, it gets a little more complex now because of damage scenarios, member out, uh, what is failure? You know, I might think, well, too much deflection is failure. Somebody else might define failure as complete collapse. What's the appropriate level of live load that you would need to carry in the faulted state? For example, the Delaware River Bridge where the cord fractured that I had shown, that carried traffic for six weeks. Simply surviving the fracture is only one part of the equation. There should be some live load you need to carry until it is found. And what level of analysis is needed? This was part of a, an NCHRP study that Dr. Corkmans talked about earlier, NCHRP 1287, which is now published, and it, and it covered a lot of different kinds of bridges, um, small bridges, large bridges, all steel, um, and everything had to be universal. It had to be able to cover small bridges and large bridges. So admittedly, the approach is rather rigorous, but it, we feel very confident in the approach. This also then led to a different but new guide specification to look at that type of approach. What kind of analysis do we need to do? And it was also approved the same year as the internal redundancy. So uh, Dr. Korkmaz talked about this a little bit, but these are the benefits in terms of types of structures when you perform this analysis. As he had talked about, uh, one of the states, Wisconsin, just to our north here in the United States uh, from Indiana, uh, asked us to, to try to do the analysis on a family of types of bridges called tub girder bridges or twin tubs. And, you know, without getting into any details, all of the bridges we studied were easily able to pass the criteria. The conclusion is they are not fracture critical, right? In other words, rather than probably would collapse, they probably would not. In fact, they would not because of the type of loading and the level of uh, reliability we have in the structure. But what was very nice is that all the work that was done, the analysis is tedious, it's complex, as Jem had indicated. It allowed us to take and look at the whole family of structures and to come up with very simple criteria that engineers in the normal design office can implement to ensure the structure would satisfy the provisions. And so that's also now being validated and going to be added to the guide specifications. And our hope is that we'll be able to do this with other kinds of structures uh, in the near future, say two girder bridges. So I'll just leave some closing thoughts on this idea of fracture. And really it, it applies in the United States, uh, but we're hoping to be a little more rational of it, the concept of the fracture critical member. You know, I, I think it's always good to look to the past before we start trying to change things in the future. Why did, how did we get to where we got? Well, the fracture control plan in the U.S. has been in service 40 years. We have no evidence that there's ever been a problem, any fractures, since its introduction. So that's, that's good. <laughs> um, but since its introduction, we've improved material, fabrication, inspection, fatigue design. And so the bridges today are far more reliable than those even at the beginning of the introduction of the fracture control plan. That is a good thing because although we're far advanced, we don't take advantage of the good thing. And so the views of many engineers haven't changed, unfortunately. In other words, we have many engineers, I believe, who are still living in the 1970s, where they feel that, well, there's two girders, it's still fracture critical. No matter what you do, we need to uh, begin to view things a little more modern, maybe change our wardrobe, so to speak. So the biggest challenge that we find uh, as, as we've uh, been talking about this over the past few years, and, and we're beginning to see a change in the attitudes of engineers, fortunately, after talking about this for a number of years, is the emotion. There's two girders, and it will likely fail. Again, we keep thinking of the silver bridge that was fabricated in the 1920s, about 100 years ago, yet we still believe we're building bridges like that, and we're not. And so we have to get past that. So. Just a closing thought here. We hope that uh, this conversation maybe sometime in the future will take place and uh, the fracture control plan will be something that uh, we have. We do our fabrication, we do our inspection, but we don't have a fear 
of these kinds of members, and that it will allow us to have reliable economical uh, steel bridges uh, and uh, something that's very much needed here right now in terms of the aging infrastructure. And so with that, I'll conclude. Um, one last thing, I, I do want to invite anyone, if you're in the U.S. and you happen to be, uh, we're just south of Chicago, a um, few kilometers, and if you're able to visit Purdue, please uh, reach out to us. I uh, would love to show you our Steel Bridge Center um, and Age Center for Aging Infrastructure, a portion of which is shown here. Uh, we have complete bridges here on site, bridge components, um, all kinds of different things that we use for inspecting uh, or training rather bridge inspectors, engineers, our students. Um, people talk about using unmanned aerial vehicles for inspection while we have bridges with defects, uh, all different kinds of things. And so it's a very unique center. We believe the only thing like it in the, in the world, uh, there could be something, but as far as we know. Um, and this is about a view of approximately half of the facility. And so with that, I'll conclude. And I thank you again for the opportunity to uh, present this material and would be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Conner, thank you for this great and informative presentation. Thank you. Uh, so Mr. Mesty raised the hand and uh, Mr. Mesty, I will allow to talk to you right now. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Mr. Conner. Uh, I've actually been to your center and been to your yeah. class. Uh, I, I learned quite a bit from it. Um, I was curious, I know I've heard you speak about uh, going to a more risk-based inspection interval in the U.S., and I'm curious, since this is a global conference, uh, if there's been any progress anywhere else in the world in, in taking up an approach like that instead of just, you know, every two years, no matter what. Yeah, I would have to defer to other people in the audience to see how they've actually implemented. I know um, in the current, and, I, and I'm sure you're with Illinois, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, um, the, uh, I believe you've probably seen or maybe you even reviewed some of the Code of Federal Regulation changes that are on the table right now. Of course, they're probably gonna be delayed with administration changes, but um, we are moving forward with the work that you probably know Glenn Washer over at Missouri uh, that we did on the risk-based inspection for all bridges. Uh, so I believe it's moving forward here. My understanding is other countries do similar type things. I don't know uh, how widely implemented it is. Um, but in terms of the fracture critical, this, like, like this, this takes them off that list. Uh, and so I didn't get into the actual implementation, say, of the inspection for internal redundant members, but there's a specific approach that's recommended for those uh, at a specific interval. In terms of the uh, SRMs, um, they just would be inspected like any other bridge member because failure of one of the girders is no more... Um, has no more consequence than one girder in a 10 girder bridge. So uh, right now, anyway, they, they would just fall under normal bridge inspection type criteria. But the risk-based approach overall is moving forward with different intervals. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Connor, uh, there is one more question. Sure. Uh, do, we want, do you want me to read? Uh, yeah, please, please, I don't see it, so. Okay, uh, this question from Elena Dragomirescu. Uh, the question is, one of the bridges which finally did not carry a live load anymore and collapsed was I-35W Mississippi River Bridge in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Was that bridge failure preventable by using redundant member or periodic inspection? Yeah, that's a very good question. So 35W, I was part of the failure investigation team on that. 35W is often cited as that. 35W failed because of a design error in the gusset plate. The gusset plate was supposed to be, without getting into details, uh, 25 millimeters thick, and it ended up being 12 millimeters thick. It had to do with a change in steel strength. So that's a little different, right? Because design errors are very difficult to, um, you know, in other words, a design error, you can't really inspect away, right? You can inspect all the time if there's a design error. And in fact, I question whether or not redundancy would make any difference in that regard, because if there's a design error and it's systemic throughout the structure, let's say all the field splices were designed poorly in a multi-girder bridge, there was some error by a factor of two, um, how do you know the redundancy is gonna, gonna help you out at all? So 35W had nothing to do with fatigue, fracture, crack propagation, anything like that. There was a design error. The difference with 35W than with other types of, say, truss failures is 
member failure is different than like say a gusset plate failure, right? In fact, at the Esprite Center, we have the 35W joints. We're the only place that has any from NTSB and we've re-erected it to kind of illustrate to people what happened. Um, the whole joint came apart. And so when those kinds of things happen, that's different than taking one member out. That's what, that's what this type of work is focused on. It's presumed, you would have to check this nowadays, of course, in trusses, but you would have to verify that the connections have adequate capacity and then you can do your member out scenarios. But if you were to remove the entire joint, if you felt that was a um, viable failure mode, uh, I'm not sure how it would be, but if you felt that it was, say pin failure in a pin connected truss, um, then yeah, you, you should look at that. I think these were the questions. Thank you, Mr. Kanner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next keynote speaker is Hussein Kopkallı. Sir, can you hear me? Mr. Kopkallı. Okay, uh, I think you hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I'll start my present. Uh, good evening. Good evening, you too. Uh, I am uh, presenting the, our topic in behalf of uh, myself and my colleague Diab Kazim. And we are, we, uh, do you see my presentation? Uh, no, no, we couldn't. Okay, let me. I think somehow I am not that great to do that. <laughs> We can raise it again. Okay. There's a share screen button. Yes. Okay. Now I have to get my presentation. <laughs> Uh, I think you are seeing the wrong screen right now. Somehow I couldn't switch it to the right screen. Can we share our screen to show how to do it? Mr. Kokkala, if you uh, want, we can share our screen to show how you can do it. Uh, okay, this is uh, one thing and then I believe I'll switch the screens.
Somehow I'm having difficulty. Mr. Kopkala, we cannot show you right now to our screen because we are on Zoom screen and it cannot be shareable. Yeah. Um, what is your problem uh, about sharing your screen or your presentation? Oh, actually, my presentation is fine. Okay. Uh, but okay. Most of the you can see participants' QA pools, chat, and share screen parts. Yes, I did. Do you see now? Uh, no. Unfortunately, we cannot see. Because I think I am on the right screen. That's uh, definitely. You have to hit share a screen. Let's click the share screen by your mouse. Mm -hmm. You don't see it? Still? No, we still cannot see. The presentation. No. If oh, you, uh, if you have Mr. Kopkalu, we can uh, share your presentation. Uh, from uh, the copy I send it to you? Yes. Uh, okay, because the thing is, according to my screen, it shows everything, but somehow you don't see it. Yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, when you... Click the share screen button. Uh, uh, did you choose the right screen? Because there's several screen view. Yes, I chose the right screen. Uh, okay. Share, uh, and then it uh, shows the green box around it, or uh, blue green box. Okay, I think, yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kupala. It worked now. Now? Yeah, we can see your presentation. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the being late. Thank you, and sorry for the late. Okay, uh, I was uh, stuck over here. Uh, my colleague and I uh, uh, thankful to Bridge organization giving us the opportunity to virtually present. We hope the next time to we'll present in person. Uh, on this presentation, our topic is the major upgrade to Istanbul Iconic suspension bridges, which we have been working since 2013 and beginning of this year, except the uh, replacement of the hangers at FSM Bridge, hey, so you got it all figured out. everything is completed. Yeah. Uh, our uh, uh, so what, what's their what's their long term plan? You know, outline. Wrong, uh, of the work is shown on this uh, slide. Condition assessment of major uh, main cables of both bridges. Nonlinear analysis of both types of suspension systems for service load, seismic, and during construction. Replacement or reconfiguration of and rehabilitation of suspension system, including the modification. Uh, Bosphorus Bridge yeah. Tower seismic retrofit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. link replacement. Well, I think this is a good one, though, because it. Main expansion. I kind of feel like this is kind of a good case example. Or sort of like, hey, this was what really good have now, right? Anger and replacement of this was a rational decision on it and what could or couldn't go wrong kind of thing. Uh, so that was cool. Bosphorus Bridge is the first major crossing in Turkey, built in 1970, hmm. uh, open to construction in 1973. And main span is 1,074 meters. And the bank spans has no suspend, uh, suspender. <laughs> and it is one of the three bridges built this way with inclined hangers. 
towers are steel and superstructure is orthotropic box girders. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, yeah, because I'm thinking something that doesn't make sense. Yeah, okay. Okay. Somehow I'm having a problem. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad you caught that because, yeah, the thing I had caught because I, I wanted to email you that because the one on their website. The cable uh, evaluation outline, cable inspection at 14 locations per bridge, under cable band wire testing status, near tower top locations, lab, uh, lab test, cable strength models, fatigue evaluation and remaining life, cable reinforcement options. Uh, th this slide shows uh, half of the bridge, Bosphorus bridge, the location of the cable inspections. And this slide is original construction of the Bosphorus Bridge. And this is the location of the cable inspections. In-depth cable inspections. Uh, during the inspection, uh, cable wrapping were uh, removed and then also the uh, main cable is exposed. The main cable is made of the parallel wires and uh, wire wrapping and then also protective wrapping. Uh, my colleague is actually on this picture. Uh, evaluating the corrosions. Uh, based on our uh, analysis, uh, we look into the uh, locations and then we found out the corrosion grades from three to four at the locations and most of them were underside of the existing cable bands and especially under one of the tower saddles. Uh, this shows actually the sample and then uh, our measurement and then the showing the broken wires at the saddle. Uh, the other problem was uh, the existing cable bands were made uh, and it leave gap between uh, upper and bottom parts and there was no caulking or caulkings were removed or never replaced. Uh, as it's shown over here, you could see the most of the corroded areas uh, just before the upper part of the cable band and then lower part of the cable band. Wire testing. Uh, wire testing uh, was done at Columbia University. It was full length wire test, tensile test, fatigue and SEM tests. Uh, tested wire strength uh, uh, over here, it shows the tested wire strength correlation with the corrosion level. Uh, of course, the worst portion is the low strength. Uh, this one is, it shows the lab uh, and the condition of the uh, wire sampled and Mr. Kazim is at the lab 
analyzing the uh, wires. And as shown over here with the magnification of 50 and 100, uh, the condition of the wires and uh, fracture uh, uh, shows the brittle fracture due to the corrosion and micro cracking. Uh, this is the fatigue load uh, testing envelope. Fatigue testing was performed to establish the fracture toughness and the remaining service height. And since the cable transition varies along the cable, and in order to accurately calculate the factor of safety at each of the seven locations along the cable, a computer model was prepared for that purpose. Uh, cable strength estimation, we follow the NCHRP report 554 with a little improvements. And then the strength models were uh, simplified model, brittle wire model, limited ductility model. And for the cable uh, strength estimation, the, that formula was used. Cable's uh, safety factor calculated. Cable factor of safety must be 2.2, but mitigation is required if factor of safety is under 2.1. Uh, our analysis showed that cable strengthening was necessary to restore the cable strength to an acceptable limit of 2.2. Uh, we use the bypass system uh, or the saddles. This picture shows the final product of the cable strengthening. Actually, those are the additional cables. I believe it is visible when if you pass through the Bosphorus bridge now. Uh, the other uh, thing we work on this one is uh, in order to prevent further corrosion and preserve the cable safety factor in the future, uh, we utilize a state-of-the-art dry in air injection system. Uh, advanced research was done at Columbia University. Uh, the system was tested before it was installed at the bridge. This one shows the location of the main cable dehumidification system. Uh, anchorages, uh, side span centers, uh, we have exhaust in uh, ports at the green, uh, shown at the green arrow, they show the injection ports. They are also the same at the top of the towers and then the quarter points of the main cable. Replacement of the cable bands. Uh, the cable bands had some problems. We could not even remove the bolts because they were bent. Uh, that's why we uh, designed a new cable bands. Uh, with proper proper caulking and sealing proofs. Uh, the design features of the new cable bands are cast steel cable band with vertical bolts, same as the existing, caulking groove for the proper sealing, and contractors are supposed to measure diameter at each cable band locations for the proper Uh, this is the comparison of new cable band and existing cable band. Uh, existing cable band has shear uh, tabs, but uh, between upper and lower cable bands, there were no 
when we inspect it, there were no uh, caulking or sealing elements. Uh, the new cable band has uh, just a straight uh, part and then it was left for the uh, proper caulking. Uh, this one shows a cable band and the exhaust port uh, after installation. This is one of the lowest points at the bridge and then as seen over here uh, the space between upper and lower cable bands were properly caught and uh, around the board size, the wrapping and the cable bands were sealed properly. Uh, uh, this shows the, one of the uh, exhaust or cable injection ports. Uh, this is a unique uh, cable port, has zinc wedges to improve airflow and, uh, and it also houses the corrosion sensors. And it has also additional sensors like temperature and unit sensors and which uh, data is collected uh, and monitored by KGM right now. Uh, the other thing was the uh, unification of the cable splays in the anch anchorages. As known, the anchorage chambers are pretty huge. Therefore, a 12 uh, millimeter diameter strands were uh, installed to support uh, polyethylene enclosures. Uh, it shows the design picture and also after the installation. Uh, since this bridge was uh, designed in 1970, uh, earlier than 1970s and built in 1973, uh, of course the code requirements were different than nowadays. So in order to verify the aerodynamic stability of the bridge and the towers, wind tunnel, uh, wind tunnel testing was performed. Uh, wind uh, tunnel testing uh, was done by Politecnico di Milano. And then also uh, uh, the other consultant prior to we start to this project uh, did the analysis and uh, their analysis resulted in very high stresses in towers from the wind. Uh, after the wind tunnel testing, static uh, aerodynamic coefficients for the towers and deck determined. Hangar replacement. Uh, existing Bosphorus bridge had uh, inclined uh, hangers, which has some structural problematic characteristic, and we analyze as it was, and also replacement of the hangers with inclined to keep the original appearance of the bridge, and then. Uh, also, the other option was replacing it with the vertical hangers. Uh, existing hangar evaluation done, safety factor was 3 for service load and 2.2 for the ultimate load cases. And all the load cases were in accordance with the Euro code, plus uh, for certain reason, military had certain military loading on it. Also, they were included in the analysis. Uh, as shown over here, one, uh, 160 of 236 hangers had uh, demand capacity greater than one. Another 54 hangers exhibited fates. 214 of 236 hangers are recommended for replacement. And uh, after the studies, we recommended to replace all hangers. 
the existing condition uh, shown as in the, uh, the slide, and then it shows actually all stress at the pin and cassette plates were reinforced with the uh, additional stiffeners. Uh, since those are the inclined hangers, always unequal forces, sometimes zero, sometimes uh, exceeding the maximum capacity, and they exhibited broken wires, cable bands, bolts, bent, and overstress. Uh, the other uh, problems uh, we detected was cable uh, bands, uh, bolts were bent and cannot be removed. There was no caulking crew and water was intruding into the bands. Uh, during computer analysis, we consider that load, live load, temperature, wind, uh, time uh, history analysis for seismic, erection analysis, and load cases per euro. Uh, inclined hanger replacement with inclined hanger. Uh, this one shows the replacement sequence. And you know, install a new system of where uh, of vertical temporary hangers, transfer that load to the temporary hangers and then replace inclined hangers, cable bands and gusset plates, transfer that load to the new inclined hangers, remove temporary hangers, perform hanger tension survey and final adjustment for the hanger tensions. Uh, hanger replacement with vertical hanger alternate. Install cable bands, gusset plates, and hangers. Transfer that load to the new hangers. Remove existing inclined hangers. Perform hanger tension survey and final adjustment of the hanger tensions. As shown or comparison both, of course, we are getting away from one of the steps, which is actually if it is inclined hanger replacement, you have to have the same thing plus installing the new inclined hangers. Uh, in the vertical hanger alternate, we use double hangers, structural strength, uh, strength hangers instead of wire ropes. And those were five, 55 millimeter diameter, cast steel lower linkage assembly with pro boy, uh, provision for jacking device and structural steel lower gusset plates. The uh, design was uh, 80 plus years of life. Therefore, the outer layers of the uh, wires received class C galvanizing. And the gusset plates uh, were made of 25 millimeter thick with the stiffening around the pinholes and uh, bottom and top connections. We also utilize multi-rotational bearings at the pins and installed to the uh, force. Uh, and then we had uh, the device is actually to install and tension the uh, hangers with the jacking device as shown in this one. And still uh, the cable bands utilize the vertical bolts. Uh, over here it shows the gusset place. Uh, since uh, we change, uh, we were uh, using the vertical hangers, the location of the gusset plates were changed. Uh, for that reason, we had to actually uh, stiffen the box girders in order to take the new loads. And this shows stiffening of the 
uh, lower gusset pl uh, plates and box girders. Uh, this shows the uh, hanger uh, cable band cassette plate replacement sequence and uh, when we install the new uh, hangers uh, where they cross the existing hangers uh, we put the strength protector and then uh, of course the cable bands were installed and then cassette plates were placed and the last thing was installing the hanger assemblies and uh, everything was done under the traffic and we did not have to interrupt the traffic and it was really smooth operations uh, this shows as design hanger arrangement and in comparison to current hangar arrangement, and below shows the pictures. And this is a large picture of the same. Tower reinforcement. Uh, existing uh, towers were studied uh, prior to us, and they found out it was over stress under the dead load or stress for the wind, or stress for the seismic, and extensive strengthening was required. Uh, this shows uh, uh, longitudinal tower moons under uh, different loading conditions, and also comparison of incline hanger and vertical hanger. Uh, we also uh, add the dampers on the center tie to reduce tower moments. Uh, this shows the location of the uh, internal stiffening diaphragms at the towers. And uh, this uh, stiffening frames were installed inside and then uh, in order to make the appearance better, countersunk bolts were used. Uh, we also installed uh, longitudinal restraint for seismic. This one is the at the lowest point of the cable at the center. And then dampers were... The last installed. five minutes, sir. Excuse me? Uh, last five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, dampers were installed at the towers. And this shows the picture and the graphical view of it. Rocker link replacement. The existing uh, bridge had the triangular shape of rocker links, which resisted both lateral loads and longitudinal uh, and transfer loads. Uh, we replaced the uh, rocker links with vertical ones, and then we also add a transverse shear key at the towers. This one shows pictures and also the model. Expansion joint uh, replacement. Existing expansion joints was the finger type of joint. Uh, expansion side is in the main span, and the fixed side, uh, fixed part was on the side spans. Uh, the joints were replaced with the modular joints, and then this is also shows the stages of construction. It was uh, replaced in three stages and existing joints were removed, modular joints were installed. This shows the bottom view and completed uh, joint. 
orthotropic take fatigue retrofit. Uh, there were lots of fatigue cracks at the orthotropic take uh, ribs. And then uh, this was studied and then uh, welds were removed and re-welded. Also the core drilling and grinding the bottom of the uh, uh, plates so that it is uh, bringing up to the current requirements and guidelines. Another improvement was all existing rib uh, splices were welded. They were replaced with bolted. Uh, Fatih Sultan Mehmet Bridge. Fatih Sultan Mehmet Bridge, we uh, almost did the same thing as uh, we have done for the Bosphorus Bridge. It was kind of adopting similar uh, things for fatigue uh, cracks, uh, cable pres uh, pre uh, preservation. And then only a change was actually Fatih Sultan Mehmet bridge was designed with, with vertical hangers and they are going to be replaced with the vertical hangers. Uh, the problem was original hangers was actually uh, uh, existing hangers had uh, trumpet shape uh, connections at the bottom and at top, especially the, at the bottom, uh, the water accumulated and then uh, cables were corroded. Originally we look at a couple of them and then finally all the uh, hangers were inspected and we had several deficiencies. And then uh, also they were wire ropes, we are replacing them with structural strength with the heavy class C galvanizing on other wires and that will be no sleeves and then the, similar to the Bosphorus bridge we are also employing spherical bearings at top at bottom connections. Uh, this shows uh, the actually uh, they are not replaced yet as far as I know uh, we finished the uh, design drawings and submitted to uh, KGM uh, in March of this year, but I never heard it was actually advertised for the replacement. On this one, in order to uh, replace, we added part to existing custom plate uh, in order to hang temporary and then replace cable bands and uh, hangers. Uh, we would like to uh, acknowledge KGM's management and maintenance teams for their exceptional support and guidance during design and construction, which made this project possible. And then we work per, uh, uh, at design phase and construction support services. Also, uh, we work in coordination with the contractors a, uh, IHI and Macul uh, joint venture, and we, we are thankful for their cooperation. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you for this uh, great and informative presentation, Mr. Kopkalda. There's a question uh, I'm going to read for you uh, from Elena Drago Mirescu. Did the natural frequencies change after the retrofitting of tower, cables, hangers, and girder stiffening? Was the model analysis conducted? Of course. Actually, we had uh, ANSYS models, and then it was extensively analyzed uh, for the new configuration. And also, when we replaced the hangers, location of the hangers were changed. Also. Uh, when it is changed, it affected the uh, box girders because both bones were, uh, were not the same place. And then also at the cable, main cables, uh, 
anger, uh, since hangar locations change, of course, in comparison to original design, we had to do almost a new design type of analysis. Uh, besides that one, the improvement in the uh, design codes, requirements were changed, especially seismic code is in comparison to 1970s, which I was a student, we were, Istanbul wasn't even in a, in a seismic zone at that time that much. And right now, actually it is uh, different. And uh, also the other thing is that when we were doing the FSM bridge, there was an earthquake in Istanbul and if you look into the actually uh, strain gauge and then uh, monitoring uh, done by Bosphorus University and the output, if it would affect our design. Of course, this is a suspension bridge. It didn't affect that much. And the seismic effects were felt more at the bottom of the towers. Uh, is there any question for Mr. Kopkalla? Okay, thank you, sir, for this presentation again. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and being a keynote presenter at the conference. Okay. Uh, hopefully, you. next conference we'll do it in person. Thank you. Now uh, I will give the word to Professor Abjanar. Thank you.